All right, so we're now going to take a look at a very strange kind of slice of the .NET ecosystem, and that is, of course, the functional perspective and the F-sharp programming language. So you're probably thinking, well, why does this section even exist? I mean, this course is about gang of four patterns, they're object-oriented, why are we talking about the functional stuff? Well, I thought I would add this section of the course just because it's fun. So here's what we're going to see in this section of the course. So you probably know that the functional paradigm is actually supported in both the C-sharp and the F-sharp programming languages, and both languages claim to be multi-paradigm, meaning they fully support both the object-oriented stuff, the kind of stuff that's related to the Gang of Four patterns, and the functional programming as well. Now, F-sharp is more of a functional uh, programming language than C-sharp. Now, C-sharp has plenty of those same features, but there is still more in F-sharp at the moment that uh, might be interesting to you if you're interested in programming in general and programming on the dead not framework specifically and you're you might be asking yourself well if i want to use a particular pattern is there any benefit to using f sharp as opposed to c sharp now uh the functional specific design patterns are a separate world. They are a separate reality. They are not object oriented, obviously. They are not the gang of four patterns that we've looked at in this course, and they are typically called monads. So that's a separate kind of reality, a separate, uh, separate problem area, shall we say. But uh, there is also a way to use the functional programming languages like F-sharp to implement the classic gang of four patterns, even though they mainly exist in the object-oriented paradigm. Because F-sharp supports uh, object orientation as well, some of those patterns can be implemented in F-sharp, and we are going to see some of the interesting ways in which you can do that. And this is what this bonus section is actually, is actually all about. So, what are we going to take a look at in terms of just the functional language features? So, this section obviously assumes that you know F-sharp. I don't uh, present any kind of introduction to the F-sharp language. You, you're you going to have to find your own sources for learning F-sharp if you don't use it already. I'm just going to mention some of the stuff that F-sharp has and uh, that we're going to leverage. So, F-sharp is a functional first kind of language. It has functional literals. It's very easy to uh, create functions and to pass functions into functions. It's uh, very easy to compose functions. So there are operators for functional composition. Like if you want to apply two functions one after another, there's an operator to kind of fuse the two functions together. And uh, there are additional benefits uh, such as tail recursion, which are specifically designed for uh, functional programming languages. And of course, there are also features which are not functional in and of themselves, but they exist to support the functional programming paradigm. Programming paradigm. So in F-sharp, those features are the following. We have discriminated unions, we have functional lists, and in actual fact, even with ordinary lists, the whole business of creating them, for example, is a lot easier than in C-sharp. It's just that the syntax is a bit more flexible. And uh, of course, once you have lists or you have uh, discriminated unions, you can do a wonderful pattern matching. And this includes really advanced stuff like, let's say, partial patterns, for example, that, that kind of stuff. So this is what we're going to see in this section of the course, or at least some of these features we're going to try and leverage in order to implement and some of the uh, Gang of Four patterns that you already know about. Okay, so patterns. Uh, what patterns are we going to take a look at? Well, we're going to investigate the following. So we'll take a look at Builder, but this time round, uh, we're going to take a look at how to leverage uh, the list functionality of F sharp of sharp of, to make something like a DSL. So domain specific languages are uh, languages which are specific to a particular domain. So for example, the HTML language is specific to the web. And we can try and emulate some of those languages inside the F sharp programming language using list construction. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, then we'll take a look at decorators. Now, uh, decorators is what well, simply the idea of uh, functions wrapping functions effectively. Uh, we'll take a look at factories. And in particular, I want to demonstrate uh, in-place construction of interface types or abstract types. This is something that's not available in C-sharp and in F-sharp you can do it. And it, it looks a bit weird, but it, it does have its uses. Uh, we'll take a look at interpreter and in actual fact, also the visitor pattern by parsing a structure into discriminated union members. So we'll see how you can map uh, a chunk of text onto a discriminated union. And we'll also take a look at how to traverse that discriminated union, although that's 
that's more more basic shall we say we'll take a look at a strategy uh, pattern implemented using higher order functions and also the template method once again using functions being passed into functions so that's what we're going to take a look at in this section of the course All right, we're now going to take a look at the builder design pattern in F Sharp, and specifically, we're going to take a look at the construction of domain specific languages. Now, the language we're going to implement is very simple. We're going to take a small subset of HTML, which, as I'm sure you know, is the language of the web, and we are going to output this using the F Sharp code. So, essentially, what we want to model is we want to model something like the following we want to model a paragraph that contains some text and it also contains an image. So an image can have a source of some kind, .png from some website, and this is how you would uh, represent a very small chunk of HTML. And we want to express it in F Sharp. Now, the way we're going to do this is we're going to leverage the idea of lists because functional lists in F Sharp have a very succinct way of uh, creation. So the creation of those lists is really neat. So we're going to write something like the following. We're going to have Let's have a uh, main method, a bunch of arguments. So I'm going to create a chunk of HTML equals, and it's going to be a paragraph. And the paragraph is going to contain the following. So it's going to contain some text, maybe check out this picture. And it's also going to contain an image. So here I'll use IMG and I'm going to say this is going to be an image called, uh, let's say, pokemon.com slash Pikachu dot png for example so we want to be able first of all to uh, have this as a valid chunk of code and then we want it to render to a web page or a chunk of a web page so how do we implement this well uh, this is actually all compilable code the reason why it's compilable is because essentially what's happening here is we're calling a function p with an argument and that argument is a list and and here similarly we're calling a function called img where the argument is just argument is just a string so let's take a look at how we can implement both p as well as img so let's first of all implement p let p args so a paragraph can have any number of elements as you can see here it has two elements here is element number one and uh here is element number two so they are separated by line breaks so this paragraph has two elements so we want to take all the arguments and we want to uh, join them using line breaks first of all so i'll say let all args equals so we'll take the arguments and then we'll use uh, string dot concat so we'll concatenate every single one of those strings with a line break in between every single one of them. So now we have separate strings. And of course, what we need to do is we need to take a paragraph and we need to wrap the paragraph tags around all of these arguments. So here we'll make a list where inside the list we'll have the opening paragraph tag, which is P. Uh, then we'll have all the arguments and then we'll have the closing tag slash p like this so we have all of this and we can once again use the concatenation function string concat just concatenate concatenating the whole thing with a line break once again so this is how you build up a paragraph now let's do the image part so let img url so it takes an argument which is the address of the image and here we simply render the string so we have img src equals backslash then the url then the closing backslash and then slash and uh, the closing of the tag so this is how you get img to work and now that we have this whole thing we can actually output this uh to the terminal for example so here i can say uh, printfn so i can just output a string and i can take all of this html and just output it as a string and let's return this let's return the zero at the end of the program so uh this is what we have, and uh, let's actually run this to take a look at what uh, what's going on. So let's uh, let's run this. Let's see what we get here. All right. So, funnily enough, we get absolutely nothing. There is absolutely nothing in the output, which is rather depressing, and that's because we forgot to mark the thing as an entry point. So entry point. And let's try this once again. Maybe it will work the second time round. And, uh, well, here we go. So here is a paragraph, and inside this paragraph you get to check out the picture, IMG, blah, blah, blah. And here is the closing paragraph tag. 
So this is a demonstration of how you can use lists as well as functions to have a sort of domain-specific language implementation of some language or another inside F Sharp. All right, we're now going to take a look at decorators, but decorators in a different way, because uh, normally you think about decorators as classes which wrap other classes and add additional behaviors. But in a functional paradigm, you're essentially talking about functions which wrap other functions. And that's what we're going to take a look at. So let's imagine that you have some function for doing work. So we have a function called do work. And this function, all it does, let's just do a very simple print line here. So it's going to say doing some work. So this is your unit of work and we can have an entry point here uh, where we actually use it. So let main equals, and here we can uh, use this uh, function. So we can certainly call it like this, do work, or we can define it as, as kind of variable as a, or as a function which calls the whole thing. So we can say let, uh, let work equals do work. And then uh, we can call work like this, which, which results in roughly the same thing. Now, what you want to be able to do, for example, is you want to be able to time the amount that the do work function actually takes. So how long does this occupy the CPU? And for this, you can use a decorator, albeit a functional decorator, and it would look something like the following. So a decorator would itself be a function, let's call it logger. And this would be a function that takes the actual unit of work, takes the function that you want to perform. And also you can specify a name just for the sake of outputting this extra information. So here you can, for example, start a stopwatch. So you can say let us w equals stopwatch dot start new. So we create and start a new stopwatch. And then we can output some additional diagnostic information. For example, we can tell people what the name of the function actually is. So we can say entering entering function and then uh, provide the actual name here and uh, then we can perform the work of course we have to do the work uh, like so we stop the stopwatch so sw.stop uh, like so and then we can uh, output more information so we can tell you for example that we're exiting the method so printfn uh, we can say that we are exiting uh, method uh, percent s and percent f seconds have elapsed where uh, the method name is name and the number of seconds that have elapsed is um, uh, sw.elapsed.total seconds. Total seconds like so. In our case, well, in our case, it might be zero because we're not really doing much as we're sort of calling this thing. So how would you actually use this decorator? So instead of having do work here, you would say logger uh, do work and you would also provide some name like do work maybe with an underscore just so you can see the uh, uh, difference so we would define it like this and uh, let's put a couple of round brackets here just so that we can actually call it so let work equals logger do work and then we can invoke work and see what the end result is so let's actually run this just to see that uh, the whole thing does in fact uh, work and give us gives us some particular results. So uh, there are a couple of issues here. And one of those issues is that we made a mistake somewhere and we're going to uh, maybe correct that mistake, hopefully. I mean, I don't know what's going on. Um, do we need to have the argv arguments maybe just so this thing is complete? Yeah, so um, here we go. So we are entering function do work uh, we're doing some work and then we're exiting the method do work and here we can see the output so that's how many seconds including the fractional part how many seconds have elapsed how much time we've spent doing uh, this amount of work uh, the takeaway from this example is that essentially you can have a function like do work here and you can also build decorators and decorators are simply functions which wrap functions so it's kind of uh, rem reminiscent of uh, Python's decorators, except of course Python has a particular support uh, for decorators in terms of syntax, in terms of its attributes. In F# -sharp, you don't get any of that. You just uh, get the ability to pass a function into a function and then call it from in here while also doing additional things. So that is the functional variety of a decorator. All right, now let's talk about factories.
So a factory is, uh, well, it can be a class or it can be a method which produces something. And we're going to take a look at a rather unusual approach that uh, the F-Sharp language allows you to have. So let's suppose that uh, what we're going to produce is a country. So we're going to have a type uh, country and we're going to be making either the US of A, whoops, or the United Kingdom. There we go. So what we can do, and this is a discriminated union, by the way. So essentially, uh, behind the scenes, of course, you have a class called country, and then you have subclasses USA and UK. But of course, F sharp makes it so that uh, these things are, uh, they appear to you as if they were enum members or something to that effect. So somewhat different. Now, what you can do with a discriminated union is you can give it a uh, member. So just like... Uh, giving an enum an extension method for example here what you can do is you can give it a member so you can say type country with and you can have a static member uh, called create for example so that's going to be a function which is going to take a string and it's going to use that string to create one of those two countries so if somebody says usa or if somebody says america and i know it's not fair to equate america and usa then we're going to return usa uh, otherwise, if somebody says UK, or if somebody says England, and once again, I know that England isn't the only part of the UK, then we're going to return the UK. And if somebody asks for something else, then we're just going to crash. Uh, fail with no such country, because apparently only two countries exist on this planet. So this is how you would define what is effectively a factory method, but it's a factory method which is defined on um, not a single class, but behind the scenes, it's defined on a hierarchy of classes. So you have a country, and then you have different types of country. You have USA and UK. So, uh, of course, you have to be aware of how um, this uh, functions in F sharp, as well as how this compiles into IL, because, of course, uh, inside the intermediate language, there is no explicit support for discriminated unions. It's all implemented with classes anyway. So these effectively become a base class and a bunch of uh, inherited uh, classes like so. So this is uh, one of the ways in which you can actually construct a country. So in this case, let me actually show you how this would work. And let's try to be careful to have all the entry point and all the args specified correctly, because otherwise nothing will work. So let main arg v equals so what you can do here is you can for example make the uk so let uk equals um well you can do uh country dot uh country dot create of course that's that's one possibility so you can say uh country dot create and then you can say uk and then this way you will actually uh, create the United Kingdom, and then you can, uh, you can, for example, print its capital. Of course, we don't have any support for uh, capitals yet. So let's suppose you want to have support for capitals. You want to support, uh, you want to provide information about the capital of each country. Now, one way you can do this is you can start, uh, you know, expanding the uh, enum cases or the uh, discriminated union cases. Uh, but there is a completely different way, and that way is to simply augment, uh, to sort of uh, provide effectively another factory, which will uh, give you this information. So what we can do, and this is going to be a bit crazy, but we're going to define a uh, type called, let's say, iCountryInfo. iCountryInfo, which is going to have an abstract member called capital, which is going to be a string. So what we're saying is that everyone that implements iCountry Info has to provide a capital of some kind. Now, typically in the c -sharp paradigm, what you would expect is you would expect classes which implement this. But in the f -sharp paradigm, you don't really have to, uh, you don't have to do it. So what you can do instead is you can have something like the following. So now we're going to have a, a factory or factory method or factory function, however you want to call it, called make. So we have let make uh, country equals. So here, once again, the idea is that uh, somebody is providing a country like USA or UK, for example, and they're getting an I country info with the capital. So here I can match country with and now we can match against the different discriminated union cases. So if somebody gives us USA, 
then here we can do something very interesting, very interesting. So remember I said that in the C-sharp language you would typically inherit from info. Well, in the F-sharp language you don't have to. What you can do is you can just do a bunch of curly braces and here you can say new info, and then you can specify all those missing members. So all those abstract members can be implemented right here. So I can say new info with and uh, here I can say member x dot capital equals Washington. Washington, like so. And similarly for the UK, for example, I can do the same thing. So here I can say new I country info uh, with uh, member x dot capital equals London, like so. And this would allow me to effectively do the following. So I can say, uh, for example, let USA equals make country dot USA. And this would give me an I member in our structure, which would have Washington as the capital, so I can print it. So I can actually go ahead and print FN uh, USA dot capital. So the capital of the United States. So let's actually run this just to see that it does in fact function, which uh, hopefully it runs this time. My previous few demos have been a bit scratchy. So here where you can see that the capital is in fact Washington. So what is the takeaway from this demo? There's nothing particularly magical here. So the first thing is to realize that when you have a discriminated union, you can also give it members and you can give it a member like create, which basically makes it a uh, factory method or a factory function for that discriminated union. So here um, in my case, but in particular, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm expecting a string. And uh, one annoying thing that you'll find, and this is really annoying, especially coming from the C-sharp world, is that um, there is no uh, sort of name argument here. There is no sort of switch name here, nothing like that. So there is no match name. Instead, it's kind of implicit. So the first argument is implicit, and that is the argument that gets checked against uh, the different cases. And then we return the case uh, from the uh, discriminated union. So that is uh, somewhat unpleasant, but I'm sure you can live with it. And it's uh, it's somewhat readable, I would say. There is some loss of information here, because obviously you would expect an argument, because that argument is being checked here and here respectively. But yeah, we, we've lost that. So the second thing uh, that I wanted to demonstrate is this idea that you could have a type which has an abstract member. So think of it like an abstract class or an interface. And uh, you end up being able to create new kind of anonymous instances of it. So effectively here you create an anonymous instance which implements all the missing pieces. So the idea is so long as you implement the missing pieces, you can actually return this thing. So you return this thing. So here we basically return uh, effectively a new type where the member is satisfied by this expression. So in this case, we return Washington. In this case, we return London. So once again, this is an approach which is uh, fundamentally different to what C sharp does. And hopefully it highlights uh, the idea that it is possible to uh, create functions in a slightly different way. You know, I really don't like those demos where there is no code writing and all the code has already been written. But unfortunately, this is one of those demos because it's rather complicated. And the reason why it's rather complicated is because I've managed to rip this out of a commercial product. So this is actual production code as opposed to something wishy-washy. Although it's a production code that I have to cut down very significantly to explain some of the ideas. So we are talking about the interpreter design pattern and to a degree about of the visitor design pattern as well. And let me outline the problem that this chunk of code is trying to solve. So let's suppose that we want uh, to define mathematical expressions in XML, like here. So here you see there is a math tag and then there is a plus and two values, two and three. So we're trying to do two plus three. And in actual fact, this is a valid language. This is a language called MathML, which is used behind the scenes in many math, which is used behind the scenes in many mathematical editors, including the Microsoft uh, equation editor, which uh, if you include formulae in Microsoft Word, for example, you can output 
Uh, you can grab the output as MathML. So this is the kind of text that we intend to interpret and we want to have the interpreter design pattern, but it's also going to be mapped onto something more complicated than what we've seen before. Because what we want to do is we want to map these things onto cases of a discriminated union. And you can see that union right here. So we have a type called expression, which is a discriminated union. And you can either have a math which contains a bunch of expressions. So this is the top level element, or you can have a plus which has a left hand side and the right hand side. And you can see an example here. So here is a plus and here is the left hand side and here is the right hand side. And you can have a value in this case, that would be two or so we want to somehow map this text onto this discriminated union. And also notice here we have self.val, which basically evaluates the thing. So if it's a value, we just return that value cast to an int. If it is a plus, then we add up the left and right hand side. Don't forget we have to evaluate them first of all. And if it's the whole math thing, then we just evaluate whatever is the first element, which is m.head. Remember, m is a list. So the first element of a list is called head. That's what we evaluate. So when we evaluate math, we essentially evaluate the plus and we return the plus. So this is how you would define the structure. And this is how you would define the code. The problem is how do you glue those things together? Because you want to somehow automatically make a mapping between the name of the tag here. This is an XML tag. And you want to map this XML tag to this particular discriminated union case. Now the trick to, now the trick to do this is to pre-compute the constructors for the different union cases. Now here is uh, the actual process in action. So this is basically reflection, but reflection for the functional programming side, reflection for the F sharp side of things. So it's not the kind of reflection you see in C sharp, but it's very similar. So first of all, we can use F sharp type to get all the union cases. So we take an expression and we get all the union cases. And then we do something clever for every single one of those cases, we pre-compute the union constructor. So we pre-compute the constructor for that particular element of the discriminated union. So we pre-compute the constructor for math, a constructor for plus, a constructor for value, and so on and so forth. And of course, as we do this, we have to take into account the fact that these things actually take additional arguments. So the plus is composed of a left and right hand sides, the value is composed of a value, and so on and so forth. So we have to pre-compute it in all of these cases. Now, what you're in the recursive build function is a rather complicated way of making these cases dependent upon the parameters that we have parsed from XML, because what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to parse this particular chunk of XML and actually automatically turn it into a discriminated union agglomeration, if you want. So how is this done? Well, uh, it's uh, done uh, down here. So let's take a look at how the whole thing can work. How can we actually read the XML and how can we turn it into something meaningful? So here we take the text, which is that chunk of XML I've shown you. We create an XML reader from that and then an XML document. So xdocument.load. Now this is from system.xml.link, I believe. So this is a fairly, uh, fairly obvious stuff, but this is where interesting things happen. So we take the root of the document, which is of course that math uh, thing and we call recursive build on it. So recursive build is that scary function that we looked at, which takes a root X element and then we do some stuff as element. Of course, uh, what we do depends on, for example, whether it has any inner elements, whether it has any arguments and so on and so forth. So it's a rather complicated procedure that is happening here. However, the result of this procedure is you end up with a discriminated union case, which inside itself contains all the other cases. So this is what you get when you actually parse the whole thing. And then of course, uh, you, we can print the parsed result, but we can also evaluate the result. Now, remember, evaluation is basically the calculation of the whole thing. So if you've got the overall math element, you just evaluate the head. If you've got a plus, you can evaluate the left-hand side plus the right-hand side. And it's also possible to do it via a member like this. So you can do self.val instead. So uh, those two possibilities are available to you. So this is essentially a demonstration of the visitor design pattern because we are traversing a structure. And while we do this, we kind of evaluate the, the different elements here. Of course, we have it in a, rec we're doing it in a recursive way. So when you call eval left-hand side, you may end up here once again, or may, you may end up here. So it's all going to 
to be a large recursive call, which is why there is no separate variable for the result of the calculation. So we keep the calculation on the stack as we do tail recursion to, to sort of calculate this whole thing. Well, tail recursion in some cases. And then we can actually output both the result of the parsed uh, structure uh, so if we parse the numeric expression, it should be should be able to say 2 plus 3, and then we can also calculate its value. So let's actually run this, let's take a look at what the output is. Uh, nothing uh, particularly groundbreaking will be happening here, we just see that 2 plus 3 is equal to 5, but uh, the implementation itself is rather interesting and quite different to what you have in C-sharp. So the differences, just to outline the differences once again, first of all, we use discriminated unions, so structure which behind the scenes, of course, it just uses ordinary inheritance and whatnot, but in terms of the usability, it's a bit more usable than working with uh, hierarchies of classes in C-sharp. Um, the discriminated union uh, basically gets populated with the results, uh, with the parsed result of uh, the uh, XML. Uh, there is some magic with like uh, reflection type magic for pre-computing the union constructors just to make things a bit faster and then uh, plenty of work to make sure that uh, we parse everything correctly regardless of the number of arguments that this thing has and of course we do it recursively so here if uh, we have a bunch of values inside the tag then we recursively build those elements as well and we kind of assign them all uh, and there is some you know some box invocations here and whatnot so you're welcome to actually download this code and simply analyze it because i'm not going to go through it it's really not uh, important to our particular discussion our particular discussion because all i'm trying to show here is that there is this alternative approach to building first of all interpreters in the sense that you can parse not into just a uh, disjoint bunch of uh, classes inheriting from classes but a kind of integrated structure that you can subsequently do pattern matching on so this is another useful thing so you match against a particular expression and of course every single case of the discriminated union has a bunch of arguments and you can ex sort of uh, examine those arguments and do something to them now c-sharp is kind of catching up to that in the sense that in c-sharp you can do very similar things right now but in f-sharp it's a bit more natural it's a bit more succinct so that is something that you might want to consider if you're building an application in C-sharp, for example, but part of an application needs to do parsing, you might want to consider just uh, using F-sharp just for this particular person's purpose. So parsing some expression, building a tree out of it, and traversing that tree. So long as you don't have to expose that tree to the C-sharp side of things, everything is okay. If you do have to expose it, then you start seeing problems because as soon as you start projecting code from f sharp to c sharp you get uh, not incompatibilities uh, but you get uh, sort of impedance mismatches because obviously the syntax is different the way you work with construct is different so you're not going to be able to work um, with a discriminated union cases succinctly from c sharp you probably know that already so that is another approach that I wanted to demonstrate how to uh, leverage the, the interpreter pattern as well as the visitor pattern as well. So pattern matching in F sharp is uh, great for uh, implementing the visitor pattern. And uh, of course, the idea is, is different. You typically rely on recursion. You typically rely on calling yourself once again uh, from inside that pattern. And there are obviously there's additional depth to the pattern support in F sharp. So for example, there are partial patterns and uh, recursive patterns and whatnot. So this is something that is worth investigating if you have uh, this particular problem in your application. Both the strategy pattern and the template method pattern can also be uh, done in a functional way. And this is, of course, done using higher order functions. And higher order functions sounds really pompous, but it's really just the idea of functions which take other functions. So uh, just as a reminder, what we had in the uh, demo of the strategy pattern done in C-sharp is we had a list, and that list was output either using uh, the HTML notation or the markdown notation. So we're going to do exactly the same thing now in F-sharp, and you're going to see some of the differences. Uh, compared to C sharp. So once again, let's make an entry point. Entry point like so. And uh, what I'm going to have is let main arg v equals. Now let's make a bunch of items. Uh, just a list with hello and uh, world. Like so. And uh, let's take a look at how we how we can process this list. So we're going to have a function called process list, uh, which is going to take 
items. But what we can do is we can uh, specify it even further. We can uh, have this function as a kind of general function that can be used by additional functions like let process list HTML and similarly let process list markdown. So both of these would take the items and they would simply call this underlying function with a bunch of specifics. So in this case, the specifics you need are the following. You need the start token, which in the case of HTML would be the UL, let's say, tag. Uh, then you need the item action. So this is a function. This is a function that we're going to call for adding a list element. And then we need the end token, the token that goes at the very end. So in the case of HTML, you would call process list, uh, list uh, providing the items. Uh, the opening tag is UL, unordered list. Uh, then you'll have a function for adding uh, the different items to uh, the uh, overall list, and then you have the closing tag. Okay, now in F sharp, what you can do is you can define a function right here. So we can have a function which takes i and uh, just creates an entry. So you have a bunch of spaces for indentation, then you have a list item, uh, then you have the actual element, and then you have the closing tag, like so. So as you can see what's happening be behind uh, the scenes here, these round braces, you, you basically construct a function in place and you put that function as an argument. So this is the item action right here. Okay, let's do the same thing for markdown. So let process list markdown items rather items like so I got to correct some of these things items equals process list items. And of course, there is no preamble, there is no start of the list. The function simply adds the list item with a asterisk in front. So we get an asterisk followed by the actual element. And then once again, there is nothing towards the end, just an empty string. So now we can uh, specify this process list function. So this is a general purpose function which operates regardless of whether you are using HTML or Markdown or whatever else. So uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to first of all compose the middle part. Uh, that's the part without the preamble and the closing. And then we're going to have a list, a concatenated list of everything. So first of all, let's say let mid. So that's the middle part. We're going to, uh, basically going to take every single one of the items and we're going to do the following. So first of all, we, first of all, we uh, map them to item action. So we perform the action on every single element inside that list. And then what we do is we concatenate them using uh, line breaks like so so now all we have is we have a bunch of items that have been rendered with line breaks and we need the start and end token so we make a list where we have the start token then uh, the middle and then the end token and once again we take that list and we concatenate it so string.concat once again concatenate them using a line break and that way we get one big string so now we can try all of this out because it's now a complete example that we can actually print. So let's uh, print fn uh, percent s. So we'll try processing the uh, list using HTML items and I'll duplicate this and we'll also do process list using markdown. So we'll try both of these examples and see what we get. So let's actually run this. Dum -da dum. And as you can see, we get the correct output. So first of all, we have the unordered list with two list items, and then we have just the markdown representation when there is no start and end of a list. There is just the asterisk before every single element. So this is essentially how you uh, implement the strategy pattern in a functional way. So here the strategy is uh, item action, you could say, is the strategy, but also there is customization because these start and end tokens, they are also important. So this is the strategy pattern in F sharp. So the difference between the template method and the uh, strategy patterns in the C sharp programming language is that one uses 
uh, composition, whereas another uses inheritance. Now, of course, in the functional paradigm, you don't really concern yourself with inheritance that much. So inheritance exists. That's true. You can replicate the C-sharp example in F-sharp, but it's much more natural to once again use functions. In, in this case, what really happens is both the strategy pattern and the template method pattern in the F-sharp programming language are pretty much the same thing if you continue to think in purely functional terms, because all you're talking about is functions which are higher order because they take other functions as arguments. So let's actually replicate the example that we had when we looked at the template method for the c -sharp language. Let's replicate this example in uh, F-sharp. And remember this example uh, basically concerned the game of chess or indeed any kind of game where there is any number of players. We basically performed a simulation where uh, the game had some state and we kind of went through the motions of defining the different actions. So the initial action that happens in the game, the starting action, the, the action that gets uh, done on every turn, and then checking for a winner. So we're going to do the same thing in F-sharp now. So the first thing I want to define is I want to define the state of the game. Now, F-sharp is, strictly speaking, the kind of language that prefers immutable structures. It doesn't like things which mutate. But when you have a game which keeps changing, it's really really bizarre approach to keep recreating those data structures. Instead, you want a mutable data structure. So you want some sort of a game state uh, which is basically, well, in our case, it's just going to be a type with a bunch of mutable fields. So we'll have a mutable field for the current player, which is going to be an int. So I'm replicating the example that we looked at when we uh, discussed the whole bit, uh, discussed the whole business of uh, uh, the whole business of uh, this pattern in C sharp. Then we're going to have a mutable number of players, also an int, and uh, we also have the winning player, uh, the index of the winning player, which is also an int. So this is our structure, and we can actually um, have some sort of uh, general purpose template method for running a game, regardless of which game it actually is. So the template method would look something like the following, run game, and then you would provide a bunch of things. And typically, because this is a functional approach and you don't have some sort of class with a bunch of, uh, let's say, constructor arguments that you have to specify, this is the next best thing. So you run a game, uh, the game has some initial state, uh, there is some sort of start action, the action that happens when the game starts. There is a take turn action, and then there is a have winner, who the winner actually is, and whether or not we do in fact have a winner. So the initial state of the game is the initial state. So we just copy it like this. Then we call the start action on the state. And uh, one thing you'll notice is that uh, here we're calling start action, which takes an argument. But in the function signature, there is no indication that start action takes an argument. That's a bit of a pain point because you can't, it's not obvious that you have to provide some sort of uh, function which takes one argument exactly. So we call the start action and then while we don't have a winner, so while not have winner action state, we do the following. So we actually play the game, take turn action state. So all of these uh, functions that we provide Start action, take to an action, have winner action, they all take a state as a parameter. And then we print the ID of the winner. Print fn, uh, player, uh, percent i, uh, percent i uh, wins. Uh, so that would be state dot winning player. Okay, so uh, state dot winning player comes from here, of course. So we're assuming that the state that gets passed around in here is actually a game state. Once again, there is no obvious indication that this somehow relates to this, apart from the fact that we're calling winning player here. Okay, so this is the template method. So this uh, function is a template function. It's a function which can be customized depending on the kind of game that you're playing. So if you want chess, for example, let chess equals, this is where you would customize it. So you would have some uh, chess specific stuff like, uh, I don't know, you can track the number of turns, for example, you can simulate how many turns at maximum you can take. In, in a real game of chess, of course, there is no limit. You play as many as time allows, but here we'll make some mutable variables. 
so the current turn has uh, the, the number zero and uh, the maximum number of turns uh, can be 10, for example. And then we need to create the game state because the game state is what we track. The game state is, you know, we pass the initial state and this is what gets mutated all over the place. So let state equals a bunch of curly braces. Notice there is no need to specify a type here, so the compiler will infer that this is a game state as soon as we start actually populating it. So the number of players, uh, actually that should be an S here, number of players is equal to two because the game of chess is with two players. The current player is going to have an index of zero and uh, the winning player uh, is going to have, uh, well, at the moment, it's going to have a value of minus one because we don't have a winner just yet. I think that I think we need semicolons at the end of this, but the syntax a bit bizarre, to be honest. Um, okay, so now that we have this let statement, what we can do is we can create the functions which will be provided into the template function. So remember, we have to have a start action, a take turn action, and have winner action. All of these need to be functions. So first of all, we'll have a function called start which of course takes a state. And here we can just print fn that we are starting a game of chess with the percent i players. So that's state um, number of players. Of course, we know that a game of chess is always two players. I'm just illustrating a bunch of concepts here. So uh, another thing is we need a function for taking a turn. Let take turn state. So what's going to happen here is, first of all, we'll announce that uh, a turn has been taken. So we're going to say that turn percent i taken uh, by player percent i, uh, where uh, the turn index is called turn and the state current player tells us the current player. Uh, then we can change the current player so we can increment the current player. So we can increment this by one modulo the total number of players. So we can say state dot current player uh, is uh, assigned state current player plus one modular state number of players uh once again we can increment the turn uh turn plus one and then uh we can specify the winning player the state winning player we're going to say that uh the winning player is going to be the current player so when the game ends the player whose turn it is actually wins the game so we'll say state dot current player like so okay so now we have two out of the three functions that need to be provided. We have the start action and we have the take turn action. Now we need the have winner action. So uh, I'm just going to say let have winner state equals turn equals max turn. So we reach the maximum number of turns and that's when we determine that the game is over and we actually have a wheel chess works, of course, but uh, this is all something of a simulation, shall we say. So now that we have all of this, our function chess is actually going to run the template method or the template function if you want to be precise with your terminology called run game which is a general purpose function which works with any kind of game so that's what we do here we call run game and we provide those parts so we provide the initial state uh, we provide the start function the take turn function and the have winner function there we go and now we can try running all of this so let's make an entry point uh, let's make sure to correctly write the main method. And here you would simply call chess. There we go. So this is how you'd run the whole thing. Let's actually try to compile and see see what we get as the end result. Dum, dum, dum. Here we go. So we're starting a game of chess with two players. And then the output just sort of cycles between player zero and player one, all the player one, all the way until player zero wins at turn 10, whatever. So this is an illustration of the template method as it is supported in F sharp. So essentially the template method is a function which takes a bunch of other functions. You can specify those functions, not necessarily at the top level. So here you'll notice that these functions are actually nested inside the, uh, the chess function. So they're functions inside a function, they're nested functions. And you can provide those and uh, just, just pass them as arguments. And the, the only real problem, the only thing that concerns me with F sharp is how poorly documented the whole situation is. So you, you don't really know that start action needs to be a function which takes a state. So, so right here. So this is something which is um, 
a bit experimental, shall we say, or maybe you need lots of documentation. You need lots of XML comments explaining how to actually call this thing, which of course makes it a bit more painful. But this is the gist of how to implement the template method programming language.